Uh, so now we have Raphael from Intel, who's going to tell us about the future of power management in Linux. Enjoy. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to th thank the LCA uh, for allowing me to speak here in the first place. It's a great, great pleasure and, and privilege. Uh, so I'm Rafael Vesotsky. I uh, work uh, for Intel at the Open Source Technology Center. Uh, have been working, ha have been uh, at Intel for over five years. Uh, so yeah, I've been using Linux for over 20 years. I've been uh, contributing to the kernel for over 12 years, I think, and I have been a maintainer of uh, power management subsystems in the kernel for, uh, since 2009. So yeah, that's my background, basically. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the future of, of power management in Linux, but I, I'm not going to just say what I think is going to happen, because I, would, I wouldn't get that right most of the time. Uh, so I would like to look at the future from the perspective of, of the challenges that have to be responded to, right? To get uh, the user experience the, the way it should be, right, on, on Linux systems. So uh, for this purpose, uh, let me uh, talk. Let me say a few words about the current state of support for power management in Linux and in the kernel in particular, because this is the part I'm mostly familiar with. So that pyramid diagram um, illustrates the power management support uh, in the kernel at a very high level. So first of all, there are two kinds of power management, two types of power ma management that can be done in Linux. The first one is uh, uh, system-wide power management. The second one is working state or runtime power management. Uh, system-wide power management is, is, about, uh, is about moving the, 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 systems, the system as a whole between different states, which are system-wide, right? So, yeah, and then working state power management is about manipulating individual components of the system at runtime or, uh, or while they, uh, there is something going on in, uh, in the system. Uh, basically, there are two meta states that, can, that the system can be in. One, one of them is the working state or working meta state. The second one is a sleeping meta state. The working meta state is, is essentially a, a, a range or a, an array of, uh, of different system states. Uh, the, dif the differences between those states are, you know, be basically uh, the differences between, between uh, what, what states that the individual components are in. So the components may be doing something, may be waiting for input, may be uh, suspended at, at the time, so on. So there is a whole range of states like that. Uh, but the, the boundaries of, of, of that range are quite well defined. So one of them is, is called runtime active, or, or that's what I call it. <laughs> and that means all the components are on. They, they are, at least they have not been suspended. They do something. The other boundary is called runtime idle, and that means that even though the whole system is in the working meta state, as a whole, the, all the components are actually inactive at that point, right? All of them are, have been suspended, the, nothing happens. However, if there is an event like an interrupt from a device, then something can happen at any time. Uh, so this is what the working state is. The sleeping state, actually the sleeping meta state, it maps to one of the sleep states um, listed here. Uh, and now the, uh, the position of the given state in the diagram illustrates two things, so, or represents two things. So one of them is the uh, relative amount of, of power drawn while in the state, and this is, this is represented, or sort of represented by the width of the pyramid at, this, at the corresponding level, and then uh, the, uh, the, time to, the time necessary to get into, into the given state is uh, illustrated by the by the position 
of, of that state above the black line here. So uh, the, the higher the state is, the, the more time it takes to get to it and back from it. So that's the, uh, the big picture of it. Now to support all of that, there, there, there are multiple uh, frameworks in the Linux kernel that can be either related to, to, uh, to moving this, the system as a whole between the working meta state or the working state. Uh, I will be call it uh, the working state for brevity going forward. So we can move the system from the working state to one of the sleep states with the help of those things, or we can manipulate individual system components in the working state with the help of those uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, CPU idle is a bit special because it is used in uh, basically during in the working state, but also can be used uh, for uh, to, to put the system into into uh, into the uh, suspend to idle state. I will talk about that in in a while. So all that is there. It more or less works, gets the job done in, the, in many, many cases. However, it, I wouldn't call it a done deal. Uh, there, there, there are things that can be improved. There are things that have to be changed uh, for many reasons. So there are challenges, there are problems to solve, and let me give a longer list of those. So RT stands for real time, by the way. Uh, so these are problems I sort of see uh, today uh, that will need to be addressed at one point. Some of them are sort of relevant already, and we are working on addressing them. Some of them are uh, more like uh, long term, but, but I think that they will need to be addressed at, at one point. Anyway, so I'm now going to go through, the, uh, through all of these and in some more detail and, uh, and talk about you know what the challenge is, what 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 has what has to be done, and so on. In my opinion, or what can be done to address the problem. Uh, by the way, if you have, if you have questions, uh, please like you know uh, raise your hand or, or or signal it to me in any in any way and ask them while while a given topic is you know under discussion because I'm going to switch from one topic to another. And then it's better to just ask questions when, when, during the, uh, you know, during the discussion of the given thing. All right. So let let me start with the with the top of the list. So the system suspend. Uh, so um, yeah, these are code flows for uh, for two flavors of Linux of system suspend in Linux. This is something I call full suspend, which has been used for a long time, uh, like several years for, uh, now. Um, the thing on the right-hand side is uh, called suspend to idle. So for the purpose of the discussion today, I'm not going to go any details about those things above this level, maybe. So they are quite complicated transitions that goes through all devices in four stages each way. Uh, but in, in both cases, they, they are the, the same, basically the same code flows. So uh, there are no differences between the two uh, variants in this respect, basically. I'll, I'll get back to that in a while. So the difference is that, or the substantial difference, is that the suspend to idle flow basically ends by putting CPUs into idle states. Those idle states are actually uh, selected so they are the, the deepest idle states possible at the time, but they are still idle states. It's not like uh, uh, anything magical happens here. In this case, however, there is uh, platform support for, uh, for um, removing power from the, from the platform for the system as a whole, except for the system memory. So that theoretically allows uh, more energy to be saved if the power is there, if the, if the support is there, sorry. There are additional steps necessary to do that. So first, uh, uh, all the logical CPUs except for one have to be taken offline. Uh, but physically, this means they just go to, low power, uh, to, to, to idle states again. 
But in addition to that, all of the interrupts are migrated from them and all of the threads are migrated from them so that the system, after this step, the system is basically a single core system. And, and all of the other steps are carried out on that single core um, or single hardware thread. There has to be platform support for this, as I said, so it has to be registered with the uh, system suspend core. And, and if it is registered, then uh, the platform should be able to switch power off for the entire system, except for, uh, for the main memory and, and for a limited set of wake-up devices, that, or, or I should say inputs, that can generate wake-up events. Uh, so this thing appears to be more complicated, but in fact, this one is, is a bit harder to get right. And do you have any ideas why that can be a reason or the, 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 the case, sorry? Why this thing can be more difficult to get right than this thing? So here, uh, maybe let me start with this. We have this platform offline operation that's, that turns power off essentially by a, by a big switch, like a uh, uh, power break somewhere. And then uh, it doesn't really matter that much what happens to devices over here as long as this is sort of sane. But in this case, actually, all depends that the state that we can eventually get into depends on what, what the drivers and, and bus types and, and power and PM domains and, and, and et cetera together do to devices, right? So in this case, it is essential to do all of that right. Now, if you think about it, it's like there is a number of drivers in each system and it is quite of, you know, quite difficult to, to make them all together do the right thing. As, again, in this case, it doesn't matter too much what they really do, but in this case, it really is essential. First of all, the amount of power uh, drawn by the device itself depends on whether or not it is handled correctly during suspend. Second, it, the state, the idle state for the CPU that we can get into finally also may depend on what the, dev the devices, you know, what states the devices are in after this. So, the, the, you know, actually in this case, the drivers and so on have to, have to, do, have to do the right thing. Uh, because otherwise the, the, what we get as a result is not necessarily uh, entirely awesome. Uh, okay, so the, yeah, this is one of the reasons. Another reason is that in this case, actually the system is woken up by a limited set of, of events or a limited set of inputs that have to be configured in a specific way for this state and so on. But in this case, actually the wake up happens uh, through in-band interrupts from devices. So again, it, you know, if there are, if there's any noise, any inter interrupt noise uh, going out of devices after this operation or this transition, then this is not going to work. So we need to make sure that the, the actually the, all, the the only interrupts that can can be generated are the ones that we are uh, going to use for wake up. So this is, there are two reasons why suspend to idle is actually more difficult to get right than the full suspend. Right, but th there are reasons why it may be necessary even though it is more difficult. So there are platforms in existence today that actually don't support platform offline or any kind of operation like a big power switch and uh, they, they sort of lie to, uh, to the core by registering something that pretends to be a platform offline, but it doesn't really make sense. And, and in, in, in particular, in that case, really, it is not useful to, to carry out all, all of those CPU offline online steps shown in the previous slide because they are just not useful. Uh, but, but, 
Still, suspend to idle can be used to leverage the existing infrastructure or all the callbacks we have in the, in the kernel, everything uh, that uh, is there to support system suspend. Now you can say, you can ask, well, okay, uh, but maybe we can just get rid of the, of the system suspend infrastructure altogether, right? Maybe we don't need it, right? Because we, we have the working state, power management, so why do we need the, uh, the system suspend infrastructure at all? And the reason is that actually it allows us to, to save more energy than, um, than the system, the working state power management. Um, the reason why it, it allows us to save more energy is that uh, during the suspend to idle transition, uh, the, in, in, in one of the last steps of it, uh, the kernel suspends timekeeping, meaning no timer interrupts happen after one point in the suspend to idle state. So all of the sources of t timer interrupts, so clock event devices, are basically turned off and they don't generate any interrupts anymore. So if you put the system into suspend to idle and actually you can guarantee that devices are not, are not going to generate any interrupt noise, then the system can stay in that state if indefin indefinitely, right? So as long as the, as the battery or power supply can uh, support that. And that means there, there are fewer wake-ups or, or no wake-ups at all and, and, uh, and the components are not brought up from the low power states that are in, uh, they are in and, uh, and, and more energy is saved. So actually having a way to suspend the system as a whole is a, is a useful thing. And if, if the platform doesn't support platform offline, the suspend to idle is the only way you can do it. So, so that's, that's the reason why we need to uh, get it right at one point, uh, this, uh, the sooner the better, actually. Um, yeah. I guess everything else is in the slide, so I don't need to spend time on it. Um, okay, any questions about that part? Now you have at least every second. Yeah, but it's supposed to, to go away as well. Now, if in not in the working state, because the scheduler has. So in the working state, you have to you have to carry out some basic some basic um, how to say housekeeping of things. So for example, you have to ensure that the timers you have in the system won't like drift away from each other. Okay, clocks and so on. You have to synchronize them occasionally, sometimes. So you need an interrupt. But in this case, you, you, you specifically say, oh, I don't care about those things. I will synchronize them when, when I go back up to the working state and I don't care, right? So don't generate any timer interrupts for me, please. Thank you. Um, all right, so next thing, hibernation. So this is the workflow for hibernation. This is the workflow for the, for the operation, um, uh, allowing us to, to, to get to the point that we were in at this here, right? So the point before the hibernation operation started, this, all of that is more complicated than system suspend and far more complicated. By, but I am not going to go into details again because I don't have the time for that. Um, there are a, a couple of, uh, of, of, of comments or remarks I, I, I'd like to make regardless. So the first one is that this uh, actually requires two, um, two instances of the kernel to be, to be involved. So this is the one instance is the kernel that, that hibernates the system, creates the image, puts itself, puts itself into the image and so, saves all of that into, into storage. Uh, so far, so good. 
the second instance of the kernel is the one that that actually boots when we want to restore the Im restore the system from the image. So we have uh, it is necessary to boot a new instance of the kernel. That one will load the image and then restore the system memory from it and then finally commit the suicide by writing itself with the original kernel that was uh, containing the image and then jumping and then it finally in the last step it jumps to the to the uh, uh, to the original kernel, which is called the image kernel. So there are two kernel, two kernel instances involved in that operation. So that is not very straightforward, let's just say. And this is why it requires um, uh, support from the architecture, uh, at the architecture level. Just the last operation, the jump from, from the image kernel, uh, from, the, from the restore kernel to the image kernel requires the architecture to support the hibernation. However, uh, Except for that, or apart from that, the, there is no hardware support re required for uh, hibernation to, to work at all. Actually, it's just a uh, checkpoint restore, uh, yeah, restart, actually, checkpoint restart uh, mechanism. Okay, so we have hibernation. Uh, it doesn't want to go away. So uh, some people thought that it would go away uh, a couple of years ago, including yours truly, but that didn't happen. Um, that still is not going to happen, I think. Uh, but there are problems with hibernation, so because it doesn't want to go away, we actually will need to fix those problems. Uh, now, uh, what the problems are? Uh, or what are the problems? So first of all, uh, we, we basically let me start with this. We, we're saying that we have fixed a number of problems related to hibernation quite recently, but still there, there is a number of them. And uh, the most important ones are listed here. So first of all, uh, encrypted images, yeah, it would be nice or good or even you know, useful to have, to be able to create encrypted images if, in a straightforward way. Currently, it is possible to do that, but you need to use encrypted swap and then swap to that and uh, hibernate to that encrypted swap and so on. So setting this all up is not exactly straightforward. It can be done, it is not easy. So what would be uh, nice to have would be a way to, uh, to create encrypted images you know, in a more straightforward way. The second problem is we have something called secure boot on x86 at least, but ARM also will have that as far as I can say. Um, that allows you to control all of the, um, how to say, the, ori yeah, the origin of, of all the pieces of software that are run on your system from the firmware uh, down, to the, to, down to applications basically, right? But we don't really support uh, secure boot, or we don't use that uh, mechanism in, in the hibernation code. So basically, uh, what can happen is, this, in theory, if you use hibernation on your Linux system, somebody can put a fake image into it and then start from it and then get access to your storage, for example. That is not exactly easy to do, but in theory, it is possible. If we use secure boot, we could just avoid this problem, you know, entirely or um, altogether, and that that would be useful. So it actually, SUSE has a patch set to do that, uh, and actually it is even included in the SUSE distribution, I think. But it has been submitted upstream once, and then nobody really cared about, it or something like that. So. I don't know, but in, in any case, that it would be good to, to go back to it and, and just try to implement that in, in the mainline because that's a useful feature. Uh, okay, and there is something called persistent memory, uh, which has been taking off for quite a while, and now the question is, okay, so if, there, if persistent memory 
uh, is uh, present in all of the systems out there in a few years, then why do we need hibernation anymore? Or do we need hibernation anymore at all? Or what is going to happen? How do we, how are we going to address this thing? And that, it is completely unclear to me right now. Okay, so I'm using up my time quite quickly. All right. Any questions so far? What would you want the hardware mission to go away? I don't. No, I didn't, I don't, so I, I, as I said, I thought it would go away a couple of years ago, but I don't think so anymore. So, and then that's why the problems listed here needs to be addressed instead of just forgotten about. Okay. Um, right, so let's just move to the working state power management uh, or the, the Apart from the from the uh, from the system wide one, so uh, okay, um, there there is a problem with uh, with the ordering of uh, device suspend resume. So devices depend on each other in general, right? So the, the most obvious case is when we have a parent device and a, and a number of child devices in, below it, like a bridge and the devices below the bridge on the bus, right? This. So, but there are other cases in which devices depend on each other in more straightforward ways. So, uh, and obviously, uh, if you want to suspend and resume devices, they, the, the ordering matters, right? You can't really suspend a supplier device when the consumer device is using it, because that is going to cause problems to happen. So, there has to be a way to, uh, to take all those things into account. And by the way, those dependencies are not limited to power management. They also uh, show up in the shutdown operation and the probe remove uh, of drivers where uh, the, sometimes it is necessary to have a supplier present or active to probe the consumer device of it, right? So there are dependencies like that. And uh, if the, the, the most straightforward case, which is, which is parent-child, actually has been covered for forever by the driver car. It is built into the driver car. But uh, there, as I said, there are cases in which uh, parent-child dependencies uh, are, uh, the, 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 the dependencies go beyond the parent-child case and, and, we, need to, and we, we need a way to address those too. And there is work uh, in progress on that. So recently we have merged a, a, a series of patches implementing uh, support for something for, for, for a framework called device links, which allows uh, those dependencies to be represented in the driver car. And then they, if they are represented in the driver car, we'll take them into account automatically. Uh, and there is a way, so this is, a, this is how the link between two devices is represented, and those objects can be used to, uh, to, to represent all of the links. Uh, there, are, uh, there is an API for, for that that the drivers can use and, uh, and other bus types and so on can use. So st it, it still is a bit manual. You have to, you have to uh, actually uh, say that the dependency is there, but when, the, when it is registered with the driver card, and uh, it, it will be taken into account. So the, the, this part is, uh, is under active development, but obviously we will need to uh, handle the dependencies to get the suspend resume operations right and, and also uh, runtime power management of, of devices right. Uh, the next problem is that we need more support of uh, more power management support in device drivers. Uh, and one of the reasons is obviously suspend to idle because as I said before, right, all the, the final state depends on what the, dri what the drivers do in, uh, during the whole uh, suspend operation. Uh, also, runtime power management of devices, so the, 
the, uh, how, how far we can go with power management during, in the working state uh, or at runtime. Also depends on what the drivers do. Uh, the, there are problems here though, uh, which are the lack of documentation uh, in some cases. In other cases, there are, uh, there are devices where, or drivers, I should say drivers, where, where there is one device on the planet Earth that the drivers is necessary for, and it is very difficult to actually test changes in the driver, right? Because it only runs on the one device. Um, and there are changes that actually affect multiple devices sometimes, uh, like, for example, uh, the PCI Express ports power management that has, has been enabled recently and, and is causing problems to happen. Uh, let's just say, and, and the problem is that it affects actually a, a, a long array of, uh, the large array, I should say, of systems and at the same time. So you enable a feature that affects everybody, but it only can be tested on a subset of systems honestly, because the other ones won't use power management at all, and they, or they may use it occasionally or something. So this is, this is a wide, wide, you know, basically system-wide change. The, 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 and, and the test, test coverage is not, not ideal for it. So, yeah. And for this reason, it, it is possible to create regressions in corner cases. And, uh, and, and make people unhappy, but honestly, uh, the, we, we don't really have much choice in going to make all that work. Uh, yeah, so more about dependencies. So obviously there are cases in which devices share power resources. Uh, there, okay, that's, that's enough said, right? And there has to be a way to, uh, to represent that. We, we, we actually have code and, and uh, infrastructure for that in the kernel, but uh, it is not sufficient for one thing, which is when, oh, this is how power man management works, I mean, the, uh, for individual devices. So uh, the, the workflow is basically that the driver car, when it, needs to do something to the device, we invoke callbacks from first the PM domain object that is on top of the bus and then device driver and uh, all of those can talk to the device itself. This is optional, it, it may or may not be present. Usually there is a bus or a class <coughs> driver uh, and that will uh, handle all power management. This is the most common case. Uh, so as I said, we have those PM domains to cover those situations. They are not necessary for the case where the CPUs actually are located in power domains along with IO devices. Uh, that is going to be addressed or there is work in progress to address this particular issue. Uh, why, why this is difficult is because uh, the CPU idle subsystem that, that, that operates on CPUs or handles the power management of CPUs is separate from, the, from all the frameworks for IO devices. So we, now in order to, uh, and obviously if, if power resources are shared, then the, 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 low, the low power states you can put the CPU into will also depend on the power states you can put the devices into and will depend on what, the, what states the devices actually are at the moment. So, yeah, so there, it is necessary to somehow combine the CPU idle framework with the frameworks that operate on, on IO devices, and there is work in progress uh, in, in this area, so we'll see the outcome, hopefully shortly. Now, more, more abstract things. Five minutes? Uh, more abstract things. There are limitations of, of uh, thermal limitations and power supply limitations in systems. And there are, there are various reasons for those. But basically, as, uh, as you can see in the slide, um, 
quite often the components in the system are actually too powerful for the, for the case it is enclosed in, right? So there is a small case like a, say, tablet, and it contains very powerful components. And if you run all of them at the same time, then it will melt down or burn or explode or something. So you can't really do that. So there is too much capacity for the case the system is in. Uh, the reason why is because, first of all, those components are not very expensive, so you can actually use them in the, in, in, in the design. And the second one is, well, you may actually need uh, full performance from one of those components at a time. So for example, sometimes you, can, you, you may need uh, to run the graphics adapter very fast, and sometimes you may need to run the CPU very fast, but only one core of it. And sometimes you, can, you may need to run four cores, but a bit slower. Uh, but if you try to run everything at, the f at full capacity, then you know, bad things happen. Okay, so this is one, one, uh, one constraint, or one type of constraint. Uh, the other type of constraint uh, is that heat can accumulate, actually. So if you run something even not very fast, but fast enough to exceed the, the cap capability of the system to remove the heat from it, like there, there is no fan, for example. The case is moderately sane <laughs> or big enough, but there is no fan. Uh, so the heat cannot really go out of the system quickly enough. So if you run something too fast for too long, it, the, the result is the same as previously, right? So this is the second type of constraint. Also, there is, there is a power budget problem, right? So that there may be a power supply like a battery where you can draw only a limited amount of current from, right? So you can't exceed the current, and if you put, and if you try to run all the components at full capacity, they will draw too much current, or they will try to draw too much current from the battery, and that will cause damage to happen. And yeah, the kind of damage depends on the kind of battery, uh, basically, right? So yeah. There are problems like that, and we actually are facing them already, or have been facing them already for some time, and there are solutions. Uh, uh, there are, I would say, workarounds rather than solutions. So the, this is generally a problem that has to be addressed, uh, you know, you know on, a, uh, on a, like, General, in a general way, oh, this is the best way to put it. There are limitations related to, uh, to timing, and also um, power management can get in the way uh, here. In, and, and actually, not only can get it in a way, but sometimes it is required because you uh, because of the previous slide, right? So there may be limitations that you have to, or constraints that you have to actually follow because your case is small or, the, or you have a limited power supply or something like that. So you can't really run too fast. But at the same time, you may need to uh, meet deadlines or you may need to make, uh, uh, you need to meet some requirements regarding throughput. And so this requires actually scheduling and things like uh, resource allocation and so on, take power management into account. That, that is not done today, but it will have to, have to be done going forward, in my opinion. Similarly, uh, for... Um, this is an old problem, actually. So you, you can, and, and, and for CPUs, but it also affects devices. Uh, so you can run very fast for a short time and then go idle, or you can run slower for a longer time and do the same thing in both cases, right? So now the question is what, which one is better, what, what, what to do, right? Is it better to run fast for a short time uh, complete your work very quickly and, and then go idle, or is it, is it better to run for a longer time, uh, draw less power, but, uh, but uh, uh, 
you know, complete the same work in, uh, in, you know, in, in a longer time. And that turns out to be system dependent and workload dependent and depends on many factors. So there is no good answer, this or that. That's why people invented energy aware scheduling, which is a way to take energy or power information into account in the, in the CPU scheduler and make decisions on top of that, or taking that into account. Uh, this has been prototyped in Android. Okay, let me say one, two words, and then people work on the, on the mainline implementation of it. All right. If you have any questions, this is the time to ask. I have one more slide. Yes, if you want to continue, you can continue, or we can get questions to So, do you have any questions right now? Can you ask me a question? Sure. Well, okay, that's fine. Um, so, um, between the two cases you showed on system suspend, you show suspend to idle and more traditional, like full uh, system suspend to run. Um, you're calling the same suspend callbacks in both cases. But on, yeah. on ARM, we've seen situations in where in one case, uh, what you need to do in the system and callback is not the same as what you need to do in the other case. If you go to suspend to idle, you generally don't lose the state of the device, so you, there's not much you need to do in the suspend and resume callbacks. Uh, but when you're going to full suspend to RAM, you're generally losing much more state of the device, so you have to um, actually save that state um, during the suspend callback and restore it. But in the suspend and resume callback, you don't know what is your target state, so you don't know exactly what you need to do. And, and so, oh, is there a solution to this um, problem or? Really, so it, it's, it actually is system specific because in some cases, even for suspend to idle, you have to save devices. And that has to be, so for, uh, for systems with ACPI, we have this, um, the, 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 the function that you can use to check if the system is, is going to go through firmware or it is not going to go through firmware and then decide on top of that, right? If this is going to go through firmware, then you will save your state and do everything and then reset devices because the, you know, the firmware can do anything it wants to the, to the hardware. Uh, if it's not, you can, you can do something else. I think that generally speaking, we will need something platform specific or something that can be uh, uh, that can be provided, yeah, the information that can be provided by the platform that drivers can use in some way, but I don't think we can do it through a, through a function uh, parameter because that parameter may, may not be uh, applicable to all the systems that, uh, that uh, are in question. So, yeah, so something like a function that will tell you that what's going to happen. Are we going to suspend to idle or are we going to suspend to, to full suspend? Uh, so, and then also the same driver can be used on multiple different platforms with different requirements. So this is, is again this. Is it possible to do partial system suspend? So on multi-core systems you could sort of uh, suspend all those cores over there into idle and keep your one going. Uh, but that still is a working state power management. So, no, no, but this, no, no, yeah, I, I know what you mean, but this is the still, so the difference between the working state and, and, uh, and, uh, and sleep states in Linux is that in the working state, user space can run, and in the sleep states, user space can't run. This is the difference. So you actually want to have a state in which user space can run, but I put a number of things into low power states. And this is still working state power management, but done, uh, yeah, but done aggressively, I would say. Thirty seconds. Okay, this is a slide I didn't show. Uh, there, it is about that. 
there is a trade-off between the number of threads you can have and, uh, and the capacity of a single thread. And, uh, and that also should take energy into account. Usually it doesn't, it, people don't think about energy when they, say, when they talk about the Andal's law, for example, but they should because the, there is cost of running threads in terms of energy. Okay, uh, in which case, can we thank Raphael for telling us about power management?